My name is Jessica. I always thought I would be some big success until I got laid off from my high paying IT job and was forced to work minimum wage at my sister's shop. My old job accused me of stealing from them, which was totally not true. But they did everything they could to label me a liar and badmouth me to every other business in the city. I was blacklisted as a thief by every employer in town, so I had to ask my sister for help. Joan was two years younger than me and she owned a boutique clothing shop near the university campus. Growing up, no one ever expected Joan to be the successful one. I was the sister who got good grades and worked all the time and had big plans for the future. Joan, meanwhile, was a party girl. The fact that I now had to work for her was really tough for me to accept, especially after how unfairly I was when I got fired from my old job. To make matters worse, Joan was a terrible boss. She paid me barely enough to live on and forced me to take extra shifts whenever her other employees called in sick. I worked with a bunch of idiot teenagers, so they called in sick a lot. I needed money, so of course I took on as many shifts as I could, but it really felt like I was working all the time for very little pay. One weekend, I was planning to go on a blind date with a guy named Jim. This was my first date in months and I was really looking forward to it. But as I was getting ready, Joan called me to say that I had to come into work for the night shift. Her shop usually closed at 9, but whenever we had football games at the nearby campus, she extended the hours until 1 in the morning. She thought she'd got more foot traffic from drunk college students who might want to buy something, but it almost never worked out that way. Usually, I'd just be alone in the shop waiting for customers who never came. I tried to tell her no. This date meant a lot to me and I didn't want to cancel on him. Besides, she had a couple other employees who needed the hours. Joan didn't care. She told me that if I didn't come into work, she'd cut my hours way back and give my extra shifts to her better employees. She literally said that. Better employees. Like I was some kind of slacker for wanting a night off. Without any other option, I told her I'd work the night shift. Then I texted Jim with a very long apology explaining my situation. We'd only communicated by text before, so I thought it would be a little awkward to call him up just to cancel on him. He texted me a one-word response. Okay. That night, I showed up at Joan's store and told my coworker Michael that he could leave. He looked at me, obviously grateful that I was doing the night shift instead of him, and then hurried off. For the next hour, I stood at the counter and waited for customers to come in. No one did. I was bored and angry. I scrolled through my phone and saw photos on Instagram of Joan dancing at some club. She looked like she was having the time of her life. Another hour passed and I still didn't have any customers. I wondered if I could just close up shop early and hope that Joan wouldn't check the security cameras. But I didn't want to risk it. Then out of nowhere, I heard a man's voice say, Hello, Jessica. I practically jumped out of my skin. Someone had walked inside without me noticing, and now he was standing right behind me. I spun around and ended up face to face with Jim, the guy I had to cancel on. What are you doing here? I asked. He wasn't as handsome as his pictures, but I could tell it was the same guy. He leaned pretty close to me, smirking, and said, I wanted to surprise you. Well, you definitely did. I backed away from him. The way he just appeared like that, it was a little weird. I'm sorry about canceling, but as you can see, I'm on the clock. This is where you work, he said. Nice place. Uh-huh, I muttered. He kept wandering around the store, sliding his fingertips over all the hanging shirts and dresses. I really wanted him to leave. He was freaking me out. He walked to the front door, and for a second, it looked like he was going to walk away. But instead, he clicked the deadbolt shut, locking us both inside. Then he turned back toward me. You shouldn't have canceled on me. I apologized again, but he just glared. I bought you flowers, he shouted. I made reservations. I shaved. He charged right at me, pure anger in his eyes. And you texted me to cancel? You didn't even care enough to call? I looked around. The only exit was in the front. There weren't even any windows for me to climb out. There was a bathroom in the back, so maybe I would run in there and lock myself in. Or I could fight him off. 
He dove over the counter and reached for me. His fingers tore at my shirt, but I was able to jump back before he could grab me. I ran toward the door, but before I could unlatch the deadbolt, he reached me again. This time, he grabbed my hair and pulled hard. I felt my body fly backwards right on top of one of the displays. Wood creaked below me as the display shattered under my weight and dropped me to the floor. Pain shot through my back as I landed on some kind of box hidden under the display. As Jim lumbered closer, I looked down at the box I'd landed on. It was a microwave-sized metal safe. Normally, it would be too heavy for me to pick up easily, but I was running on adrenaline. Plus, it was the only real weapon I had. Just as Jim reached me, I picked up the <clears throat> safe and smashed it into his face. Just one strike, he instantly fell to the ground, unconscious. As Jim lay bleeding on the ground, I looked down at the safe in my hands, grateful that it saved my life. That's when I noticed the logo on the bottom of the safe. It was the same logo as my old company. It took me a second to put all the pieces together until I realized. Joan had stole from my old job and blamed me for it. That's how I got fired. That's how she was able to afford her own business. My life was miserable and hers was fantastic because she'd blame me for a crime she'd done. And I never would have found out if this psycho hadn't come after me. I called 911 and told them to come over. They'd see what happened on the security tape, and they'd also find the stolen safe that I'd used as a weapon. Thank God I'd been forced into working the night shift. That one crazy night changed my life forever. I've been cleaning houses for 25 years. Back in my 20s, I was strapped for cash and someone offered me a job to clean their house. I took it and they asked me back. Eventually, I became a cleaner full time because it made me just enough money to get by, which is all I needed. Don't get me wrong, I've seen some disgusting things, but I actually quite enjoy it. It gives me a lot of satisfaction to scrub something until it shines. The clients are what makes the job difficult. Tracy, may she rest in peace, was particularly bad. I don't want to speak ill of the dead, but she stood out as a bad customer. She would breathe down our necks while we cleaned her house. I often wanted to tell her to step back and let us do our job, but I kept a tight lip. Whenever her house was on the schedule, I knew I was in for a day. I remember mentally preparing for Tracy the last time I cleaned her home. I woke up to a text from my manager telling me that Shonda called out again, so I would have to clean the property alone. Shonda called out a lot, so I wasn't phased. I made sure to pack my headphones so I could listen to my romance novel while I cleaned. I've gotten to a point where, as long as there aren't too many properties for that day, I kind of enjoy working alone. I had two properties to clean a two-bedroom, two-bathroom condo, and Tracy's beautiful big house. Cleaning Tracy's house felt like a mammoth task, but I asked my manager if I could get paid overtime, and she agreed. As long as the money was there, I didn't mind the extra work. The condo didn't take me too long, about three and a half hours. I mentally prepared for Tracy's to take six to seven hours. She lived in a two-story home with a basement. Altogether, there are four bedrooms and four bathrooms, along with two large living areas, a dining room, and a massive kitchen. Lots of area to cover. Normally, Tracy would greet us at the door before we even had a chance to knock. This was not one of those times, so I rang the doorbell. There was no answer, so I knocked. Again, no answer. I called my manager to let them know no one was home and I couldn't get in. She told me where to find a lockbox with a key and the coat so I could let myself in, which is standard for people who hire cleaners who can't be home when we come. It felt so weird to be in that house alone. Tracy always had to be there to ensure we didn't miss a single speck of dust. I wondered where she was. I yelled out, hello, to see if anyone would respond. Maybe she took a nap and forgot to set an alarm for us. I did this a couple more times before deciding I was alone and got to cleaning. I put in my headphones and started to work in the kitchen. Every now and again while I cleaned, I heard a faint clamoring. I didn't think much of it at the time. 
It was an older house, and you know how those creak and wane. Plus, they lived on a fairly busy street, so I continued to work through it. The first story alone took me about three hours. Once it was sparkling, I made my way up the stairs. I grabbed my all-purpose cleaner and rag and started with a handrail going up the stairs. About halfway up, I noticed a dark liquid gathering at the top of the stairs. I stopped at the handrail and went to investigate. A dark red liquid formed a stream that stopped at the rug running along the upstairs hallway. When the rug could absorb no more, the blood began to crawl down the edge of it. I took out my headphones and put them in my pocket. I pulled out my phone and dialed 911 just in case. I followed that stream to the primary bedroom. On the way, I heard a clunk and froze. That noise definitely didn't come from the street. It was coming from inside the house. My heart began to race and my hands grew wet with sweat. I had to use the rag in my pocket to dry them off as I inched closer to the source of the blood. I pushed the primary bedroom door open, then pushed myself up against the wall beside the door to peer around the corner. When the coast appeared clear, I entered. The bedroom looked normal. The bed needed to be made, and I needed to pick up the clothes the couple had strewn across the room. But nothing suspicious other than the trail of blood. There were large blood smears on the carpets, like someone dragged a dead body through the room. I tiptoed my way to the bathroom. As I turned the corner, I saw a single limp foot hanging out of the tub. At the sight, I stepped back, which was when I realized a man was behind me. He grabbed me from behind, so I elbowed him in the stomach. He lurched over in pain. When he looked up at me, I sprayed him in the eyes with my cleaning spray and kicked him in the nuts. I couldn't go back to check on Tracy. I had to get out of there and call the cops. I dashed down the stairs, out the door, and called the authorities. They arrived at the scene within minutes. It turned out to be a crime of passion. The man who grabbed me was Tracy's secret boyfriend. She decided she could no longer cheat on her husband and tried to break things off with him. She wanted to repair her marriage and be a good mom to her kids. But if he couldn't have her, no one could. According to the police, Tracy died of blunt force trauma to her head. He hit her with something with a sharp edge, which is why there was so much blood. My manager offered our services to clean Tracy's house free of charge for the family's sake. For obvious reasons, she didn't have me do it. She had another cleaning team take care of it. Tracy was a handful, but no one deserved to die like she did. Back when I was in my late 20s, I worked the night shift at a local nursing home. The job wasn't particularly hard, and most of the time it was fairly dull, but there was one incident that stuck with me for many years after I quit. It had been an uneventful start to the shift. I was in the nurse's station, drinking coffee to keep me awake while keeping an eye on the monitors and filling out some paperwork in between. We had motion sensors out in the halls and alarms on the doors in case anyone tried to get in or out and every resident had a button they could press if they required assistance. It was very rare we had any sort of incident, but we were always required to be on alert just in case. It had just gone 3 a.m., and I was in the middle of filling out some forms when the motion lights in the hallway flickered on. The nurse's station was at the very end of the corridor, with a large glass window looking out into the hall where residents resided. I glanced up from my computer, expecting to see one of the residents or another nurse, but the corridor was empty. I shrugged it off at first, since the motion sensor could be finicky and sensitive at times, so I figured something small must have set it off. After a few minutes, the lights flickered off again, plunging the hallway into darkness. Only, the glow from the nurse's station lights filtered out into the gloom. The second time the lights went off, I started to wonder if I was missing something. I climbed out of my chair and left the station, glancing down the hallway. I couldn't see anything out of the ordinary. None of the residents' doors were open and nobody was out of bed. Maybe there was something faulty with the wiring. I'd heard one of the other nurses say that before. Shrugging to myself, I went back to the station and finished my work on the computer, barely noticing when the lights flickered back off. 
Apart from the occasional sound of my fingers tapping the keyboard or sipping from my flask, the place was deathly quiet. You couldn't even hear the wind outside. It almost felt like you were the only one in the entire building. It was so quiet, so still, that I almost jumped out of my skin when something tapped against the window of the nurse's station. I glanced up sharply, my heart stilling in my chest to see a face staring at me from the other side of the glass. My goodness, Mrs. Riley, you almost gave me a heart attack, I blurted, pressing a hand to my chest as I met the older woman's gaze through the window. The lady said nothing, just staring at me through the glass, her finger tapping gently against it. I got up and stepped around the partition, my earlier fright still making my breath staggered. Is everything okay, Mrs. Riley? There's someone in my room, she said in her soft, raspy voice, her eyes dim and sunken amongst folds of skin. I looked at her in surprise, my throat growing dry. There's someone in your room? What do you mean? Someone watching me, she wheezed. Someone in the shadows. I gently took her arm and led her down the hallway. Let's go have a look, shall we? I said, trying not to frown. What did she mean there was someone in her room? No alarms had gone off and I hadn't seen anyone enter through her door from my position. But then again, I hadn't even heard Mrs. Riley approaching the station, her bare feet muffled as they were against the carpet. I walked her back to her room and switched on the light inside. A cursory sweep confirmed that the room was empty. There was nobody there. Where did you see this person, Mrs. Riley? I asked. The elderly woman raised a shaky hand and pointed to the end of her bed. There. They were watching me. Her words sent a prickle of unease down my spine. Let's have a look. I left her standing by the doorway while I took a look around the room, checking behind the curtain and inside the closet, and even giving a brief glance underneath the bed. There doesn't seem to be anyone here, Mrs. Riley. Maybe you were just dreaming. Mrs. Riley shook her head, a strange expression twisting her features. It wasn't a dream. I saw someone, someone right there. With a sympathetic smile, I helped her back into bed. Well, they're gone now, you don't have to worry. The woman didn't seem convinced, but there wasn't much more I could do. There was clearly nobody here, no matter what she thought she saw. All right now, try and get back to sleep. I'll be out here if you need anything. I tucked the covers back around her and switched off the light, closing the door behind me. With a sigh, I went back to the nurse's station. Draining the last of the coffee from my flask, I rubbed a hand over my tired eyes and got back to finishing up my paperwork. The clock on the computer read 4.13 a.m. when one of the alarms went off. It was one of the call buttons from the resident rooms. When I checked where it was coming from, I felt my mouth go dry. It was Mrs. Riley's room. I hurriedly left my desk and crossed the hallway until I stopped outside her door. On the other side, I could hear the sound of whimpering, switching on the light by the wall. The woman was sitting up in the bed, staring wide-eyed across the room. Her chest was rising and falling quickly, each breath slipping raggedly between her lips. Mrs. Riley, is everything okay? I asked, hurrying over to her. She shook her head without taking her eyes off the end of the bed. They came back. That person. From before. I saw them again. I let out a gentle sigh. It wasn't uncommon for the residents here to see or hear things that weren't there. Dementia, Alzheimer's, even just the effects of the medication they were on. Some of it caused hallucinations or vivid dreams. I dealt with this kind of thing before. Whatever Mrs. Riley thought she was seeing, it wasn't real. Mrs. Riley, I already checked your room, remember? There's nobody here. I said as firmly but softly as I could, trying to get her to look at me. But I saw them, she whispered, her voice tight with desperation. I know what I saw. I shook my head. I promise you, you and I are the only ones in this room. She finally calmed down her expression growing weary. Are you sure? Are you sure there's nobody else here? I smiled and squeezed her hand. I promise. Oh, okay, she finally said. 
I'm sorry for bothering you. No bother at all. I'm here as much as you need me, okay? I left her for the second time that night, hoping that she would fall back asleep and not experience any further hallucinations. By the end of my shift at 6am, I hadn't heard from Mrs. Riley again, and assumed that she must have finally managed to get some rest. Which is why, later that day, when I got a call from the nursing home explaining that Mrs. Riley had passed away in the night, I wasn't sure what to think. Had Mrs. Riley really seen something in her room after all? Or had it simply been the senseless ramblings of a dying woman? <laughs>